Well, hello, friends, and uh, welcome to another another WSIB Truth Matters with Joe Machado on this beautiful Monday. So I'm excited uh, today. I'm going to start uh, one of a five-part series that will take place all week, uh, dealing with the issue of uh, tribunal jurisprudence. Uh, I've looked at five um, specific decisions made by the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal. Uh, where they have relied, uh, the panel or the vice chair, uh, have relied on tribunal jurisprudence in order to rule uh, in a decision in favor of the claimant. And each of these five are going to give you a, a good idea as to how the tribunal uh, relies on jurisprudence and how much of a useful tool it can be uh, in your case if you're fighting uh, or disputing some area of entitlement in your claim. So today I'm going to deal with the issue of uh, disabled by non-compensable condition uh, or loss of earnings disabled by non-compensable condition. And basically is uh, uh, an area where or, uh, or a situation where you have a pre-existing condition and you have a, a WSIB claim and the WSIB limits or denies entitlement and attributes uh, your inability to work or the lack of entitlement in your, on, on your pre-existing condition. Uh, in this case, it would be loss of earnings benefits. The decision that I'm going to refer to today is uh, decision 27194-16. I am going to put it up on the screen if you want to look up the decision um, and then get more familiar with it. But I am going to refer, with it, uh, refer to it today uh, because I think that it really demonstrates the the vast and and the uh, the significant contrast between how the tribunal looks at claims, how they adjudicate claims, and apply WSIB policy and the law, and how the WSIB appeals branch and case managers don't, uh, which is a shame, but it happens. So in this particular case, a little bit of background on this particular person. Uh, he started with the employer as a welder in 1994. His accident was in July of 2005, so a little over 11 years. Uh, the WSIB recognized that uh, he was left with a permanent impairment as a result of his injury, and he was awarded a 15% non-economic loss award to recognize that permanent impairment, which also has permanent restrictions. Um, he was diagnosed with MS in 1996. So a couple of years after he started with the employer, but the MS really did not have any effect on his ability to work. Uh, it was never an issue until the board made it an issue. Um, the employer couldn't accommodate um, his restrictions on a permanent basis. And so he was referred for labor market reentry services, which is the natural order of things when it comes to a claim with the WSIB. Excuse me. He was then referred um, for a psychovocational assessment by his uh, claims adjudicator. And the uh, rehabilitation consultant assigned to his uh, claim uh, referred him for that assessment. And upon receiving the results of the assessment, and I'm going to put this up on the screen, this is the conclusion. These, this is what the vocational uh, consultant recommended upon considering the results of the psychovocational assessment and considering the restrictions that he had uh, pertaining to his claim and also uh, his MS. Now, if you're not familiar with the psychovocational assessment, uh, it's a test uh, that's normally uh, used uh, frequently, actually, by the WSIB or case managers um, or vocational consultants or return to work specialists. They've had various names over the last 30 years. But generally, it's an assessment that's used to try and identify what that person would be able to do in terms of uh, a vocation, a, a new job, or a series of jobs, if 
that person is not able to return to their pre-accident job uh, given their restrictions. So they look at your age, your experience, your academic background, uh, any skills that you've acquired over the years. They take all of that into consideration. It's generally about a three-day assessment. You're asked a bunch of questions and, uh, and then they provide a pretty extensive report. So upon receiving that report, this is what that uh, re uh, the rehabilitation consultant recommended. I'm going to put it up on the screen here. Then I'm going to read it to you. Uh, the worker attended a psychovocational assessment on October 12, 2007. The vocational rehabilitation consultant stated the symptoms of his MS in conjunction with his physical restrictions affect his ability to return effectively to employment. This is a quote. She recommended that no labor market reentry assistance be extended to the worker, and she confirmed that recommendation on October 31, 2007, after consulting with the MS Society. What followed on November 30, 2007, is a decision by the claims adjudicator that advised the worker that he would receive full loss of earnings benefits until his 65 or 65th birthday. So pretty much everything that flowed up until this point is normal. It's consistent with the law. It's consistent with board policies and procedure. What happened next is not. This is where the train went off the rails, so to speak, or the shit hit the fan. And in plain English, the bullshit started. So less than two years later, the case manager makes a determination that the worker was partially impaired by his compensable low back injury and was capable of working part time in a direct entry suitable occupation at minimum wage. My goodness, how they come up with this crap is beyond reason. It's beyond logic. And they're obviously living on another planet because nothing changed. So the claims adjudicator referred uh, the uh, worker for work transition services, which is what was then uh, referred to after labor market reentry services or the name, the term was phased out. Why? I don't know. And she basically uh, threatened the worker that if he didn't participate in these work uh, transition services, that uh, his benefits would be reduced or discontinued. He couldn't. Nothing had changed. His situation hasn't changed. This direct entry suitable occupation, he had no idea what that was. He'd never done any of it. But in their if or in the case manager's infinite wisdom, he was miraculous, a, miraculously able to do a job he had no clue what it was and work on minimum wage part time. So he did what any reasonable, rational minded person did. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I'm appealing your decision. So he appealed it to the tribunal. And this is where jurisprudence comes in. One of the really good things about the tribunal, because you'll get justice at the tribunal. It may not be what you're looking for, but you're going to get justice because at the end of the day, they apply the law, they apply the policies of the WSIB, and they are very thorough on how they make their decisions. They don't make them arbitrarily. They don't pull shit out of the hat. And they're not really loyal to one group or another. Their role is to do what they can for the injured worker. So in that decision, the tribunal, the vice chair referenced another tribunal decision, uh, 843 forward slash 16. And this is the decision that really spells out um, why the case manager, why the appeals resolution officer and the appeals branch were wrong and basically didn't apply the, the law. Um, 
So in this uh, decision that the uh, that the uh, vice chair referenced, I'm going to put it up. He basically goes on to state: it is well established in the tribunal's jurisprudence that, as a general proposition, entitlement to benefits for a particular condition will not be limited by the fact that non-compensable factors may have contributed significantly to condition. If it can be shown that compensable work-related factors have also contributed significantly to the condition, which is the case here. The appropriate test for entitlement is whether the work, the compensable work-related factors, which are alleged to be related to the condition, can be demonstrated on a balance of probabilities to have contributed significantly to the development of the condition. The fact that other non-compensable factors may have also contributed significantly to the condition, such as the MS, will not affect entitlement. To be entitled to benefits for a condition, a worker need not demonstrate that the work activity was the sole factor contributing to the condition. It is enough to show that the work-related factors contributed significantly, again, which is the case here. So friends, as you can see, his MS may have contributed somewhat to the condition, but at the end of the day, his compensable condition didn't improve. It was still a 15% now. He did still have permanent restrictions. The employer was not able to accommodate on a permanent basis. And the, the, vocational, case man, case, uh, the vocational rehabilitation consultant, based on the psychovocational assessment and considering both the MS and his restrictions from work made a determination and a recommendation that he wouldn't be able to return to work. So I'm gonna put it up on the screen here. This is the final analysis of the uh, vice chair on this case. So basically the vice chair goes on to state, the record shows that the board determined in October, 2010, that the worker was unemployable and was entitled to full loss of earnings benefits until he was 65. In February, 2012, the case manager decided that he could return to work for 20 hours per week at minimum wage. At the final review, some nine months later, she said that he, he could work full time. These decisions were made despite the fact that there was no clinical evidence of an improvement in the condition of the worker's low back between 2010 and 2012. So she basically disregarded everything before, made this decision without any backup whatsoever and basically threaten the worker that if you do not participate we're going to cut you off which is exactly what they did so in this case my friends the tribunal ruled in favor of the worker so thank you for taking the time to watch this video i hope that you found this uh, of benefit to you um, i urge you to go out and uh, or download that decision and have a look at it um, look at whether or not it, it's similar uh, to your particular situation or somebody that you know. And hopefully um, you can use that as a tool to uh, to get some justice. If you're not familiar with tribunal, uh, tribunal jurisprudence, I urge you to have a look at my previous video uh, that basically basically talks about tribunal jurisprudence and the, uh, the tool that it can be to help you uh, deal with your WSIB issues or appeal if you're in that, um, if you're moving in that direction. Friends, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, I invite you to become a subscriber. Uh, it's free. Um, you get notified every time that I come out with a new video. Um, we have five, uh, five videos in the series, so we have four more coming up. Um, I've been doing this for over 30 years, uh, working, uh, battling against the WSIB on a professional level. Uh, I built the largest paralegal firm in Ontario with over 10,000 clients. And we've dealt with the WSIB day in and day out uh, with the appeals branch and with the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal. As you've heard me say before, I have absolutely no faith whatsoever in the WSIB decision-making process or their appeals branch. This case that I just explained to you should have never gone to the tribunal. It should have never happened. But they cost this particular claimant years of waiting to get justice because of their lack of applying the law, their lack of experience, and just disregard for their policy and for the facts. Uh, I have a lot more of information to share with you. Please share my videos with others. There's a lot of people throughout this province 
that need help. And uh, my role is to try and, and touch everybody in the province who's had a WSIB claim, who's having issues with, WSI, uh, with WSIB right now to provide tools and guidance to help them succeed uh, with their case. If you like what I've, um, the topics that I talk about, give me a thumbs up, give me your comments. I like to read the comments. Uh, if you have any specific questions about this subject, uh, please send me an email directly at Joe Machado at WSIBsettlements.com uh, with your questions and I'll, I'll reply to you. If there's a particular topic that you would like me to cover in my videos, uh, let me know that in an email and I'll work that into one of my videos. Um, I enjoyed these videos. Please become a subscriber. And um, tomorrow, coming up, part two of the series, Tribunal Jurisprudence, the Tribunal's Handling of Medical Marijuana Appeals. I know that's a, an issue that a lot of people are curious about, and I'm going to get right down to it. Uh, I'm going to cover another decision that really deals with that, and it'll probably uh, help uh, somebody out. Uh, visit my website, wsibsettlements.com. That's wsibsettlements.com. Uh, we have a program that uh, I created, I developed, specifically tailored to help injured workers, regardless of when they were injured. It could have been the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, or recent. Um, they are the, the, the tools that I've created or tailor-made to make things easy for anyone on WSIB uh, to help them manage their claims effectively. There's a lot of support along with it. So please visit wsibsettlements.com. And as always, friends, take care.